Thank you. That concludes the topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Michael Matheson on Greenhouse Gas Emissions Statistics 2020. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of the statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, last autumn, Scotland was at the forefront of global climate action when we hosted the international community at COP26. We could not have imagined today's unprecedented cost of living and energy crisis, nor the deeply concerning new landscape of international relations. However, we must not lose track of the threat posed to all of our futures by the climate crisis the facts around which are becoming even starker. In April, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a warning that it is now or never to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. In response, John Kerry, US Climate Envoy, said we have to still fight for 1.5, as hard as it may be. But I remain an optimist because I think that if we do what we have promised to do, we can achieve a 45 per cent cut in global emissions between now and 2030. Officer, I too am optimistic and believe all countries, uh, to, uh, all countries to deliver on the Glasgow Climate Pact. Of course, this applies to us here in Scotland too. The purpose of my statement is to update Parliament on the progress to Scotland's statutory climate targets and set out our next steps. These steps are constrained by the current limits of devolved powers. We will continue to work with and, where needed, challenge the UK Government to ensure urgent action is being taken in key areas that remain reserved and where a lack of pace impacts the ability to meet our more ambitious targets. However, it is also clear that the contribution that Scotland could make to global climate action would be significantly enhanced if we had the normal powers of other independent states. Officer, official statistics published this morning show that the interim greenhouse gas emission target for 2020 of a 56 per cent reduction from the 1990 baseline was met, with a 58.7 per cent reduction achieved. This outcome is welcome, as, it is, as is the fact that the data shows continued underlying progress in reducing emissions across many key sectors of our economy, such as energy supply and in waste management. It also confirms that we continue to outperform the UK as a whole in delivering long-term emission reductions. However, it is also clear that the largest changes in emissions during 2020 were significantly influenced by the public health measures taken in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, transport activity was limited as people were asked to stay at home to save lives. There can be no satisfaction taken in emission reductions resulting from such economic and social harm. We must also be prepared for emissions from trans the transport sector to substantially rebound in 2021. All of that said, today's data does provide a valuable lesson regarding the scale of the transformational change needed in response to the climate emergency and the centrality of the transport sector to achieve that aim. The challenge before us is to achieve these outcomes in a way that are sustainable and just. Whilst the 2020 data reflect the impacts of the pandemic, they do not yet capture the step change in action arising through the update of Scotland's climate change plan, which was finalised in March 2021. The updated plan is aimed at achieving our ambitious goals over the 2020s and early 2030s, which go beyond 
what is needed globally to achieve the 1.5 degrees goal as part of a green recovery from COVID-19. The latest set of annual monitoring reports on the plan laid in Parliament last month alongside our positive response to the Climate Change Committee's latest progress report contain more up-to-date information than today's high-level emissions statistics. These reports show welcome early signs of progress on policy implementation and delivery across many sectors. The Scottish Government's focus is on urgently delivering this comprehensive policy package to ensure that future targets can be met through sustainable long-term reductions in emissions across all sectors. In transport, where the impacts of COVID-19 on emissions have been so pronounced, the updated plan contains actions across all modes and has already seen us set out a positive route map for reducing overall car kilometres by 20% over the longer term. The Resource Spending Review confirms our commitment to increase investment by over 200 per cent in active travel from 2024-25 onwards. Low emission zones have been introduced in four of our cities as of last week, and we are supporting the electrification of public transport, including Scotland's railways, by decarbonising them by 2035. Scotland's shift to renewables and support for energy efficiency are also central to our plan. These are the only real long-term solutions to the current crisis around energy costs. The Resource Spending Review supports our climate actions, prioritises delivery of critical activities such as increasing spend on our heat and building strategy and for nature restoration. Our national strategy for economic transformation has a journey to net zero at its heart. Then, officer, I want to look ahead to the key steps over the remainder of this parliamentary session. We are developing just transition plans for Scotland's sectors and regions, beginning with a refreshed energy strategy and just transition plan later this year, and including detailed work to assess the pace of transition in the oil and gas sector. These will form part of our economy-wide emission reduction plans, ensuring the future targets can be met in a way that are fair to all supporting green jobs and seize opportunities for sustainable economic growth through leading the global energy transition. We have recently announced the first £20 million of the Just Transition Fund to support these efforts. We have then committed to setting out by November 2023 a draft for Parliament's scrutiny of Scotland's next full climate change plan. This will extend the emissions reductions pathway towards the ambitious 2040 target of a 90 per cent reduction and includes estimates of the costs and benefits of the policies to achieve this. In line with the requirement of the Climate Change Act, I also wrote in April to the Climate Change Committee to request their next set of regular advice on Scotland's statutory targets. This is expected in December and will help ensure our approach continues to reflect the rapidly evolving global landscape of economic circumstances and scientific evidence. COP27 in Egypt later this year will need to build from the legacy of Glasgow. As set out in our new global affairs framework and building from the trebling of our climate justice fund over this parliament, Scotland will continue to play a full part on the international stage, helping ensure that climate action supports the most vulnerable people and communities. As I have set out today, we, will, we are also working to ensure a track record of domestic delivery that matches the high ambitions set by this Parliament in response to the Paris Agreement. 
The impacts of COVID, the COVID pandemic on emissions during 2020 has further highlighted the transformational scale of action needed in response to the global climate emergency and provided a terrible lesson in the imperative needed for that transition to be a just one. Then, officer, in response, the Scottish Government's commitment to building a net zero and climate resilient nation through planned approaches that are sustainable and positive for both people and the economy is unwavering. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. I would be grateful if members who wish to ask a question were to press their request to speak buttons now. And at question number one, I call Maurice Gordon. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of the statement. For the first time in four years, Scotland's emissions targets have been met. It is bittersweet news, though, because it was only accomplished through a nationwide lockdown. Even the SNP have conceded that point and accept that they cannot rely on lockdowns to meet climate targets. But that is exactly what they are doing. Because before today, they had missed their emissions targets three years running. In addition, they had failed to meet a whole series of important targets, such as household recycling, biodiversity, green jobs and active travel not forgetting their failure to deliver a ban on sending biodegradable waste to landfill in 2021, as promised. Add in the Green Coalition's partners' failure to meet the renewable heat target and abandoning their manifesto promises on a deposit return scheme launch and banning new incineration capacity, it has been fail, fail, fail. All of this shows that the Scottish Government needs to be bolder and implement its proposed policies, particularly in heating, agriculture and transport. Chris Stark, the head of the Committee on Climate Change, predicted the 2020 emissions target would be met, but he issued a warning that the 2021 target would, and I quote, almost certainly be missed. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept this expert view or is Chris Stark wrong? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senator Officer, um, I suppose time will tell. Uh, but we do know that the likelihood is that transport emissions, which were a sizable component in the shift that we saw in the 2020 data during the course of the pandemic, um, uh, are likely to rebound, which will have an impact on the figures uh, next year, which I made reference to in my own statement. Um, I also I, I do recognise and I agree that it is a, it's bittersweet that we are in a situation where we have met the targets and no one takes any pleasure from the fact that some of that has come about as a result of the lockdown circumstances. However, I would say to the member it is simply wrong to say that we are progressing our climate change policy dependent upon taking forward lockdowns. Uh, that is not what we have set out in our climate change update plan, which we published back in March just last year that sets out almost 200 different policies that we are taking forward in order to make sure that we meet our climate change targets. But alongside that, the member, I have no doubt, will take the opportunity to consider the underlying data in some of that information that has been published today, which shows that we continue to move in the right direction in reducing our emissions overall, and that in the long term, that we continue to be ahead of other parts of the UK. I went all parts of the UK to be in a similar trajectory and working towards reducing our emissions. But it is important we continue to make the progress that we have been making. And I also want to uh, emphasise this point as well, uh, because the member made reference to the need for the Scottish Government to get on with delivering the policies that they have set out in heating, agriculture and transport specifically. I take that, that as an endorsement from the Conservative Party to support us in these key policy areas. Because very often, when we do bring forward key policies in these areas, we often find that the Conservatives are in opposition to us on these issues. So if you are going to be serious, and the Conservative Party are trying to be serious about tackling the climate emergency, which we face both at a domestic and at an international level, it also means stepping up to the plate and demonstrating the leadership that is necessary with the policy ideas that will deliver on that, rather than just thinking about the next day's headlines. Colin Smith. 
thank you, President Officer. After years of environmental failures and missed targets, last year's lockdown has granted the SNP Green Government a stay of execution. But while well, the, the Cabinet Secretary claims we outperform the rest of the UK, he knows that our per capita greenhouse gas emission, emissions remain higher than other parts of the UK. And if this year's fault is not simply going to be a blip on the radar, we do need to have a change of course. Transport emissions fell this year, but can the Cabinet Secretary tell us does he really believe we would have seen that fall had we not had the pandemic? And can he tell us what assessment has the government made of the impact on transport emissions of the current cuts in rail services? Does the Cabinet Secretary really think we will see a fall in transport emissions next year compared to pre-pandemic levels based on the current policy? Cabinet Secretary. Well, officer, let me deal with the, the three points that the member has raised. In the first point, um, he is wrong because the baseline data which is used for assessing our progress across the whole of the UK is that which is set out in the Climate Change Act, which is informed by the methodology which is set out by the Committee on Climate Change. Uh, and within that, it demonstrates very clearly that Scotland is, continues to be ahead of the rest of the UK on a long term policy uh, basis. Uh, and it's significantly ahead of areas such as Wales, where the Labour Party happen to be in control. Notwithstanding that, I want to see Wales doing well in tackling climate change as well, as I want that to be the case across of the whole of the UK and at a global level. In terms of whether the, uh, uh, global, uh, uh, whether the uh, 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 pandemic would have... Uh, uh, it would we have met our target had the pandemic not taken place? Uh, as you will be aware, the statistics that are provided today do not provide that information. It does not disaggregate uh, figures on the basis of uh, a pandemic not taking place. Therefore, uh, we do not have data that is able to demonstrate that. Uh, but I acknowledge and recognise that actually meeting what are very stretching targets, statutory targets here in Scotland, uh, are challenging for us to make, uh, rightly so. Uh, but it is also important that we take forward the policies which will help us to achieve that. And in relation to transport in particular, uh, the range of measures, a very ambitious target, we are setting around uh, 20 per cent uh, reduction in car kilometres. Uh, the measures we are taking as well in uh, the investment we are putting into active travel and also in helping to decarbonise our public transport network are all key contributors to helping to make sure that transport emissions become a smaller part of our overall global climate uh, challenge here in Scotland. And that is why I believe those are policies that will help to deliver the outcome that we are looking to achieve. Alistair Allen, to be followed by Dean Lockhart. The Independent Climate Change Committee has been clear that Scotland's ability to deliver a green recovery and reach our targets is very much dependent on action from the UK Government in areas that, unfortunately, as the Cabinet Secretary has indicated, remain reserved. What interventions does the Cabinet Secretary therefore think it is important that we see at the UK level to help us to achieve our climate ambitions here in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, uh, there are a number of important factors that need to be taken into account. So, for example, um, we have raised now on a number of occasions with the UK Government the approach that was taken with their net zero strategy did not take account of uh, policy decision making here in Scotland. Uh, they did not consult us in that process to ensure that it was reflective of the domestic policies that are necessary at a UK level to meet our statutory 2045 target, because they are working to a 2050 uh, target. And there are a number of areas where uh, greater flexibility would allow us to make greater progress. Uh, fiscal powers, uh, taxation powers, uh, progress in uh, uh, carbon capture, utilisation and storage, uh, as we have not been able to move forward with the Track 1 process for the, uh, the, the ACON uh, project. And alongside that, uh, making sure that we end the discriminatory charging against renewable energy projects here in Scotland in connecting into the GB grid. These are policies that actively make it more difficult for us to meet our statutory climate change targets, which is why the UK Government need to work with us in making sure that they are taking forward the policies that support us in meeting our 2045 target, uh, because to date that has not been the approach that they have been taking. Thank you. Before I move on to the next question, I would be grateful if we could have more concise responses, because there is a great deal of interest in your statement, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Dean Lockhart, to be followed by Evelyn Tweed. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The UK Climate Change Committee has expressed doubts on whether the Scottish Government's 2030 climate targets can be met, and has called for much greater detail and transparency on policy delivery. One of the policies that will be critical to deliver the 2030 targets is the retrofitting and decarbonisation of heat 
for over one million homes in Scotland. Will the Scottish Government accept the UK Climate Change Committee recommendations and will the Cabinet Secretary today commit to publish annual targets for the retrofitting and decarbonisation of dwellings for each of the years between now and 2030 so that we have the necessary levels of transparency for delivery of those targets? Cabinet Secretary. Epstein officer, I, I do recognise the challenge that's been uh, made by the Committee on Climate Change, the independent advisers on these matters, and it's important that government uh, responds constructively to uh, the challenge, in particular the challenge that we have around the decarbonisation, not just of domestic premises, but also non-domestic premises over the course of the period between now and 2030. Uh, what I can assure the member is that in our heating building strategy, we've got a very ambitious plan in order to make sure that we achieve that target, alongside record investment of £1.8 billion. Pounds. And I can assure the member that the approach we will be taking is one which is very focused on delivery, and it is an open and transparent process in how we go about doing that. Thank you. Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Foisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A recent report published by the Met Office researchers indicates that climate change is having a significant impact on global rainfall patterns. Notably, Scotland, along with the majority of Northern Europe, is anticipated to, anticipated to experience increasing rainfall during winter. Communities in my Stirling constituency already struggle with the impacts of annual flooding, and with this anticipated to get worse. I ask the Scottish Government what investment is being made in flood defences and mitigations in Stirling. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, uh, there is no doubt that we are experiencing the effects of the locked in effects of climate change already, which is resulting in much more intensive weather patterns, which uh, are having a disruptive impact on uh, communities and our transport network, not just here in Scotland, the UK, but on a global scale. And we have all witnessed that over the last uh, couple of years, uh, which is why it is important we take the right adaptive measures uh, and around climate adaptation. Uh, we are increasing our investment in uh, tackling uh, climate adaptation issues, in the, uh, tackling flooding issues, uh, with an increased investment of around £150 million over the course of this parliamentary session. We are also investing some £12 million in coastal erosion programmes uh, for those communities which have been impacted by that. And if I recall correctly off the top of my head, uh, there are projects in uh, Stirling, Bridge of Allen and Callender, all of which are focused on tackling flooding issues which are being supported as part of this funding. So I hope that reassures the member of the investment we are making, along with local authorities, to tackle flooding in areas such as Stirling. Foisal Chowdhury to be followed by Julian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, thanks to the decline in immersion from the energy sector, the statistics shows that domestic transport is now the largest source of greenhouse gas emission in Scotland. The report notes that there was a marked decline in this emission due to the COVID lockdown. But now the circumstance is behind us. It is crucial for our climate target that we keep this emission as low as possible. This must include having a functional rail network and expanding it to rapidly growing communities like Winchborough in the Lothian region I represent to ensure that people have the choice to opt out of private transport. Does the Scottish Government truly understand the importance of functional and widely available public transport in meeting our net zero target? And how will it get from the current chaos to that goal? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I, I do recognise the importance that reducing transport emissions has in helping to support us in achieving our statutory climate change uh, target, which is why we have been expanding and developing um, our rail network, including uh, the decarbonisation of a rail network, uh, with further electrification programmes being taken forward to support exactly that uh, type of approach that the member is looking for. I am also well aware of the issues in Winchborough. I visited the site as well, but the member will also be aware that as, uh, developers have a stated interest in this matter, uh, and it is very clear about where the financial responsibility for that uh, uh, rests. But what I can assure the member is that investing in our public transport network and decarbonising it are key parts of our strategy going forward to meet our climate change targets. Julian Martin to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. Cabinet Secretary will know of my deep concern at the frankly unbelievable decision by the UK Government not to give Track 1 status to the Scottish Cluster Carbon Capture and Storage Project, 
which includes the Acorn project in the North East, and he referenced it in answer to Alistair Allen. The economic and just transition issues are, are obvious and of great concern, but them aside, can I ask him what discussions he's had with his UK government counterparts on the impact that this decision has had on our drive to meet our net zero targets as set out in the Climate Change Act? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mr. Officer, this is an issue which I have raised repeatedly with the UK Government because I believe they got it badly wrong in not awarding Track 1 status to the ACORN project. And I think many in the sector recognise that they got it badly wrong as uh, well. So the Member can be assured that I will continue to press the UK Government um, on this issue, uh, particularly as they move towards Track 2 to get clarity on the timescale and the process uh, for the ACORN project in order to ensure that it has every possibility of succeeding in achieving Track 1 status. Uh, but uh, net zero uh, uh, negative emission technologies such as CCUS are critical to meeting our climate change targets, and that is why we need to make sure progress has been made on it. And the final point I will make is that the Scottish Government is fully behind the ACORN project, which is why um, I have agreed to make available £80 million to help to support the delivery of the project um, at a quicker pace and what we now need to see is a green light being given by the UK Government to allow this project to move forward so that we can reap not just the environmental, but also the economic and social benefits that will come from it. Liam MacArthur to be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, President of I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement and welcome his acknowledgement um, that our meeting of the emissions target after three years of failure has more to do with the lockdown um, attributable to uh, COVID than the actions, perhaps, of the Scottish Government. And for all the discussions of uh, constitutional grievance, we know that more than 50 per cent of energy used in Scotland goes into heating buildings and that the SNP's funding promises fall short of it achieving its retrofitting targets. Given this and the ongoing cost of energy crisis, can the Cabinet Secretary explain how the Government plans to urgently scale up Scotland's retrofitting activity and capacity to ensure we beat both our future emissions and fuel poverty targets? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Officer, I think um, the key to tackling, um, uh, tackling the energy crisis which we are facing just now and many households are suffering from is to help to reduce individual consumption, and that is through greater energy efficiency programmes, which is why we have got record investment going into energy efficiency programmes and why we have committed to investing a record £1.8 billion in the course of this Parliament uh, to help to support the decarbonisation of domestic premises. That is the type of ambition that will help to deliver the scale of change which is necessary. And plus, we are also working with uh, other private sector organisations to look at how we can lever in additional finance to help to support that transition even quicker. So, I think between the uh, uh, level of ambition we have set out in our strategy on tackling uh, emissions from properties in our heat and building strategy, alongside the record levels of investments which we are making with £1.8 billion over this Parliament, is testament to the ambition and the determination of this Government to reduce energy use in people's homes. John Mason, to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Clearly, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has made many countries rethink their energy policies and focus on energy security. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that energy security is best achieved through a focus on renewable and low-carbon energy? Cabinet uh, Senator, officer, the issue of energy security has become central in energy policy in a way that was not there some six uh, months ago. It is now very clear that to, in order to deliver energy security, if we look at the publications recently from the European Union, is that uh, domestic uh, renewable energy uh, production is seen as being the key way in which we can reduce both energy costs and also deliver greater energy security. Uh, that certainly accords with the Scottish Government's view, and it is the approach we will be setting out in our energy strategy later this year. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Liam Kerr. Although transport remains the biggest climate emitter, it is clear the sharp rise in walking and cycling and decline in aviation and private car use led to huge cuts in emissions in 2020. Transport Scotland's own research into travel trends during the pandemic shows us that a new normal for domestic travel is within reach. So does the Cabinet Secretary believe that demand reduction is important for all polluting modes of travel, including aviation? What plans does the Scottish Government have to establish that new normal? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, uh, demand reduction is an important part of uh, trying to change behaviour because we know that the the vast majority of the actions that we need to take in order to reduce our emissions involve behaviour 
uh, change actions, uh, which is why we have set out within, for example, our national transport strategy, our investment hierarchy, uh, which sees greater investment going into active travel uh, and public transport before looking at uh, single car use. And alongside that, we have also made a very clear commitment to work with the aviation sector to look at decarbonising aviation by 2040, while at the same time looking at the economic opportunities that are in producing sustainable aviation fuel here in Scotland as well. So we believe that the policies we have set out through the NTS and also uh, through the wider climate change strategy will deliver on the types of reductions we need to see in the years ahead. Liam Kerr to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One way of meeting targets will be supporting rural properties to transition to renewable heat. Now, the Scottish Conservative pledged in our manifesto to introduce a rural heat decarbonisation fund, as was also recommended by Scottish Renewables. The SNP and Greens copied that into their manifestos and restated it in the Butte House Agreement, yet nothing has come forward. So can the Cabinet Secretary show that this government is serious about delivering its targets by stating precisely when such a fund will be introduced? Cabinet Secretary. I'm saying, officer, the member will be aware that we are presently looking at a range of measures around our heat decarbonisation strategy and how we can help to support uh, both homes in both urban and rural areas to uh, decarbonise. There are specific aspects and challenges around decarbonisation of properties in rural areas, um, given that many of them are off uh, grid and therefore the costs that can be incurred by rural households is much greater when it comes to decarbonisation. But I can assure the member that is an issue which we are presently giving consideration to and how we will make sure that funding is available for that. Uh, and I will uh, uh, undertake to write to the member to set out more details on that uh, so that he can share that with his constituents going forward, because I am aware it is an ongoing concern for the member. And Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. How we reduce our emissions is as important as the reduction itself. And Scotland is world renowned for having underpinned our net zero targets with a legislative commitment to a just transition. So can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on the Scottish Government's Just Transition Fund, which is vital for my constituency, and whether there has been any indication uh, that the UK Government would match this £500 million investment over 10 years? Cabinet Secretary. Um, on the latter point, President Officer, no, we have had no uh, 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 confirmation from the UK Government to match our uh, £500 million uh, uh, Just Transition Fund for the North East and Murray. Um, we have opened up the consultation process just last week uh, to ask for expressions of interest, uh, with the initial £20 million being allocated to that to uh, help to start some of the initial work around the Just Transition Fund. So that process is now open, and I would simply want to take this opportunity to encourage uh, uh, the members' constituents and businesses in our constituency who have an interest in the Just Transition to engage in that consultation exercise and to make sure that we shape the way in which that fund is used in a way that delivers a Just Transition for the North East and Murray. Thank you. That concludes the Ministerial Statement on Greenhouse Gas Emissions. There will be a brief pause before the next item of business.